Massimo Pellucci, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. We spoke once before. It was episode 685 and it was right at the start of the COVID pandemic. And for those of you who want to check that one out, it's it's a philosopher Massimo Pellucci on stoicism and coping with the COVID-19 virus. And that was on March the 21st in 2020. So we, we were pretty close to the beginning of it all. Yep, right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this time you've got a new book out, Quest for Character. But before we get into that, I was just wondering if you could introduce yourself um, again to those who maybe haven't listened to that episode and just explain to us how you came to be writing about character, stoicism and um, and having this this expert view on all things stoic. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know about an expert, but, but I'm trying. Uh, I got into stoicism simply because I, at some point, like a lot of people, I went through a midlife crisis and I needed some resources to deal with that crisis. You know, nothing out of the ordinary. My father died uh, out of a, a, a after a long illness, and uh, I was hit by a sudden divorce that I was not expecting. That sort of stuff. Now, I figured that philosophy might be a place to look for resources uh, when adversity strikes, because there really are not that many options. You either go religious. Or you go philosophical. And since I, I was done with being religious um, since my teenage years, I grew up Catholic, but then I left the church. Then I figured, okay, let's look at philosophy. And so I started taking a look at what it's called practical philosophy or philosophy as a way of life. And there are a number of examples that are, you can look at Buddhism, you can uh, read about Aristotle, you can familiarize yourself with Epicurus. And all of those were very interesting. I, I did all of that. But none of them really clicked. And then at one point, I dis rediscovered really Stoicism because I, I read some of the Stoics when I was much younger, but I rediscovered Stoicism, particularly a guy named Epictetus, who was an early second century Stoic. Uh, he started out his life literally at the bottom of the, uh, of the societal rank. He was a, a slave. And then eventually he was freed and he established his own school and became one of the most sought after teachers of uh, in the entire Mediterranean area. And, and Epictetus immediately spoke to me. It was like one of those things like, okay, this guy makes sense. Uh, he's speaking plainly and clearly. Uh, he has a sense of humor bordering on sarcasm, which I appreciated. <laughs> and so I was hooked. And once I got to Stoicism through Epictetus, then of course, little by little, I sort of started reading all the other ones, Marcus Aurelius, and his meditations. Seneca is arguably the most important Stoic writer, he, he, certainly the one from whom we have the most extant writings. And so, you know, years passed, and here we are. And and here we are with this new book. So you've, you've written you've written books that are about people's um, dealing with particular or dealing with um, their own um, self development, and and books that are about the the tradition in general. But this one this one is very different. And you mentioned you mentioned there Seneca and Marcus Aurelius who particularly um, come into this one rather more than Epictetus, I think. So yeah. could you just tell us a little bit about Quest for Character? Yeah, the quest for character, which in the UK I think is published as "How to Be Good." I, I don't know why publishers changed their the titles of the books or and the, their covers, but whatever. That's that's their business. Started out because I was in, actually interested in a particular story, which gives the subtitle to the book: the story of Socrates and Alcibiades. So Socrates, of course, needs no introduction. I'd give her the most famous philosopher of all time in the Western tradition. However, Alcibiades is one of those characters that are so fascinating and yet not well known. And I, and I still wonder why nobody's actually made a movie out of his life. Yeah. I mean, this guy was in incredible, right? He was uh, impossibly handsome, uber rich, <laughs> uh, very brave, uh, dashing kind of character. You know, he was like very ambitious. It's and like, a sportsman as well, wasn't he? With exactly, his, yeah. yes. It, chariot, he won chariot races uh, at the Olympics. I mean, it's like the, the guy was all over the place. And he also happened to be a friend and student of Socrates. And that's where the story be begins to be interesting because what happened was that a very, very young Alcibiades goes to Socrates and says, you know, I have all, I think I have all it takes to be a leader in Athens. I want to be a statesman. Now, this guy was in his early 20s, right? So ambitious. 
Uh, but I, I realized that, you know, I, I, I might use some advice here. And so I come to you, my mentor, for, for some advice. And Socrates basically sets him down and gives him what we would today call a job interview and starts saying, so, okay, let's talk about what, what would you do? How would you approach problems and issues in, in the city? And it becomes very clear during the dialogue that Alcibiades is not really interested in improving the city or making it a better place or anything. He's, he's, he's interested in self-aggrandizing. He's, he's a narcissist, right? And so at some point, Socrates says, you really shouldn't do this. In mm -hmm. fact, I'm going to quote this, this, this striking passage. This is from the Alcibiades Major, which is a dialogue attributed to Plato. And Socrates says, then alas, Alcibiades, what a condition you suffer from. I hesitate to name it, but since we two are alone, it must be said. You are wedded to stupidity, best of men, of the extreme sort, as the argument accuses you and you accuse yourself. So this is why you are leaping into the affairs of the city before you have been educated. It's like, holy crap, this is really harsh uh, on the part of Socrates, right? It's like you're, you're, you suffer from stupidity, best of men. Now, the word there that is often translated as stupidity is amatia, which in Greek actually means something closer to unwisdom. So what Socrates is saying is that Alcibiades can have all of the other stuff that normally people, uh, you know, are impressed by looks and, and wealth and all that sort of stuff. But he ma he's, he's missing the important thing. The most important thing, though, he's missing a good character. He He's, he's a narcissist, he's not really into helping other, other people, and so he really shouldn't do, he shouldn't get into politics. Now, unfortunately, Alcibiades does not follow uh, Socrates' advice, and sure enough, it becomes a disaster. I mean, Alcibiades arguably was half responsible for the, the disaster uh, that, uh, it, that was the Peloponnesian War for Athens. So this is an extraordinary story, and when I, when I started reading about this, not only I was fascinated by the life and character of Alcibiades, but I thought, isn't that interesting that Socrates is now in the business of advising people, essentially giving career advice to people, wh whether to you know do or not do yeah. certain certain things, particularly in the politics. And it turns out when I looked into it a little bit more in detail that there are several other places where Socrates does that. You know, a lot of the times we think of Socrates as it emerges from the Platonic dialogues, and because Plato is the major source that we have about Socrates, but there are others. And one of the other major sources is a book by a guy named Xenophon. And the title of the book is The Memorabilia, and it's really a story of, of Socrates. And Xenophon, like Plato, was a student of Socrates, but unlike Plato, Xenophon was not a philosopher, he was a general. And so he really wasn't interested that much in the philosophy. He was interested in the politics. He was interested in practical advice that Plato, that sorry, that Socrates was going to, to, to give. And so Xenophon tells us of several instances where Socrates advises people either to get into politics or not to get into politics. And and when people follow his advice, things actually go well. So, right. so there is one case, you know, so there is one case of uh, Glaucon, for instance, who was uh, Plato's brother. Clearly not a not a good fit for for politics for for statementship. Socrates tells him so, and Glaucon actually, unlike Alcibiades, Glaucon actually follows Socrates' advice, becomes a musician, and and everything is fine. Uh, on the other hand, Carmides, who was Glaucon's own son, was not into going into politics. He didn't want to get into politics. He was shy, but Socrates thought that this guy really had what it takes in terms of character, and so he actually uh, said. You really should get into it. You really should try to be helpful to the city. And, and in fact, Carmides does. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, he does under very dire circumstances for Athens, because by that, that by that point, the city had lost the Peloponnesian War. But nevertheless, he does his best. So it turns out that you, you what, what emerges is this figure of Socrates, not the gadfly uh, that asks, uh, you know, embarrassing questions to to powerful people as we get in Plato but the person actually gives advice on career and particularly in politics and so he influences the, politi the politics of the city essentially by going around and telling people yeah you should do it or no you shouldn't do it and so and so what he's and what he's determining that on is on the person's 
intrinsic character. Correct. He's, he's looking at character. He's looking at virtue. Now, the, the problem nowadays when we talk about virtue is that people tend to think uh, of virtue in the sort of the way in which the Christian tradition does. So uh, things like charity and hope and chastity, you know, that sort of stuff. But in fact, what we're talking about is virtue in the Greco-Roman sense of the word. The original word is arete, and arete just means excellence. So to be virtuous means to be an excellent human being, the best human being you can be. Now, according to the Greeks, it, it's not just human beings that can be excellent. Anything can be excellent. For instance, mm -hmm. the other day with my wife, we went and, uh, and, and bought a new bread knife. And it is an excellent. Oh, bread, bread knife. knife is a, right. the a knife is a, one of the Aristotelian examples, isn't exactly. it? In the Nicomachean yes. Ethics, that's perfect. It is. <laughs> and so this was this one is a knife which is clearly endowed with arete. It's an excellent <laughs> knife. It it cuts the bread in an incredibly nice way, right? So now, why why would you say something like that of a knife? Because the knife has a function. Mm -hmm. As Aristotle will say, right? The function is uh, the function of a bread knife is to cut bread. So if the knife does its fun carries out its function well, then it's an excellent knife. Now, and the question is, well, what is the function of a human being? You know, how, how can you talk about excellence in a human being in a in a similar fashion? And here, the Greco-Romans, by and large, agreed. The Stoics, in particular, uh, sort of articulated this notion that. Uh, what really characterizes human beings by nature are two things. One, the fact that we're so smart. We, 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 we're rational animals, we, we, or at least potentially rational animals. We, we can use our brain to solve our problems, right? We don't, unlike other animals, we don't have strong muscles, big jaws, or you know, we don't fly. We don't do any of that stuff. What we do is we think about stuff, and, and we solve our problems that way. So that's number one. And then the second thing that characterizes humanity is the fact that we are highly social. Right? We are, I mean, there are other social animals for sure, but, but our society, human societies, are much more structured, much mm. more complex than anything else. And much bigger in terms, and of, much the, bigger. In terms of the, yeah. So it follows, therefore, that a excellent human being is a human being that uses those two characteristics of our species to the best possible in the best possible way. So, somebody who reasons very well and who is cooperative, pro-social toward other human beings—that's an excellent human being, and that's what it means to be virtuous in that sense. And this is where I mean, we will for for those um, for those watchers and listeners who are thinking, well, wait a second, where's the psychology coming in? That will be coming in shortly. There were just um, a, a couple of things I I wanted to bring up before we sort of head towards that. One is I don't know if you've read it, but Mary Reno wrote a book. I think it's called The End of the Wine or something like that, which is about mm. Alcibiades. Ah, so nice. there is yes yes, and th that uh, upon that my knowledge of Alcibiades rests, but. <laughs> I just wanted to mention it, um, and and one other thing, you know, during in in the course of the book, you go through um, the process of looking at the Socrates' relationship with Alcibiades, as well as um, Aristotle with Alexander the Great. And we don't want to give away everything for all the people who are going to go out and buy it. But there are th those various case studies. Plato also with Dionysius. Of yeah, that's a story that it's not well known, right? No, but I hadn't Plato. Heard that. Uh, you know, we typically people look at uh, Plato's dialogues, you know, the Republic, etc., um, the Apology, and so on. But Plato wrote other things. In particular, he wrote several letters to some of his friends. And one of these letters uh, recounts his experiences in, with Dionysus II of Syracuse. And basically, Plato was invited by a student of, of his, Dion, to Syracuse to try to see if he could actually put into practice his political theories by teaching virtue mm. and by teaching politics to Dionysus II. And you have to give it to, to Plato. He was in his 60s when he did that. Uh, so, so how far, got, do you know how far it would have been for you know him to have it traveled? It would have been several weeks of travel, wow. uh, some, most of which would have been at sea. Uh, and, you know, at the time, traveling by sea in the Mediterranean wasn't exactly an, a, an easy thing. So this guy in his 60s, and then he does it again later on, 10 years later. So he was in his early 70s. He takes the, you know, the boat, it goes to, to, to Syracuse and, and tries to 
put into practice his ideas. And however, unfortunately, it turned out into a disaster because Dionysus II was really not interested in in virtue and and politics and good politics. He was interested in uh, you know, pleasure and debauchery, essentially. And Plato almost lost his life. I mean, Plato almost got killed uh, as a result of of this attempt. So yeah, th that part of the book goes through a number of examples. Some in which a philosopher tries to influence a statesman, a politician, for the best. And so those are cases like Plato and Dionysus, uh, Socrates and various various people, um, Aristotle and Alexander the Great, Seneca and Nero, for instance. And then, however, I also go immediately after that, I take a look at a number of cases where the statesmen themselves, the politician themselves, actually are into philosophy. Now, philosophy, of course, here we, we need to, to make clear that I don't mean, when I say a philosopher, I don't mean somebody with a PhD uh, who works at a university and writes very ab abstruse things that only a few dozen people in the world are going to read. That, in other words, not somebody like myself. Because you're a philosopher of science. Aren't it, you, that's right. Friend? I'm a philosopher yeah. of science. So, you know, I, I do that kind of thing. What I mean is a philosopher in the ancient Greco-Roman sense of the term, meaning somebody who tries to live philosophically, who tries mm -hmm. to uh, actually enact, uh, you know, principles, ethical principles, principles in their in their lives in that sense anybody can be a philosopher in fact arguably by the end of the book i i try to make the case that everybody ought to be a philosopher in that sense <laughs> that we we all all should in fact live an ethical life as much as as we can so it turns out that cases where the statement himself uh, is a philosopher in in this particular sense they they, they go better uh, that's Marcus Aurelius, so they're more successful. They, that's things like Marcus Aurelius, for instance, uh, Julian the Apostate, who was the last uh, pagan Roman emperor. Uh, and there are a number of examples. Cato the Younger, uh, who was a Stoic during the Roman Republic. Cicero, who was also a Stoic during the Roman Republic. Well, he was Stoic-informed. Or we would say today, stoic curious. Uh, yes, you describe him as rather more pragmatic, whereas Cato's more of a, a sort of idea, not an idealist. Um, I don't know how you'd put the distinction. Yeah, a little bit more rigid. Um, mm. So that's the problem. That So the question is not just that one needs a good character, one needs to, you know, operate on the basis of principle, ethical principles, etc. But one also needs, if we're talking about a politician, one also needs to be flexible. Right, so the the Socratic view of politics is that politics ought to be informed by ethics, in fact, guided by ethics, right? That if you're an unethical, uh, then you really ought, should not be in the business of, of politics because you're going to make a disaster out of things. You're going to become Alcibiades, basically. However, the opposite extreme, there is an opposite view, which I do discuss in the book, and that's Machiavelli. So Machiavelli says, no, 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 forget about virtue. It's quite the opposite. If you want to be an, an effective politician, effective statesman, you really need to do away with, with ethics at all. It's in the, don't even bother doing that because otherwise ethics gets in the way. And uh, Machiavelli is the first modern, somewhat modern, he was, of course, back in the Renaissance, writer who uh, defended what we today call real politic. Right? Yes. So, so the political realism. Now, the problem with real politic, however, is that you know the kind of characters that actually try to implement real politic are not the kind of characters that I would like to go and have dinner with, like you know Mao Zedong, for instance, or Henry Kissinger, or you know people like that. It's like, mm, hold on a sec. So there must be something in between, and and the something in between actually, I think, is arguably best uh, exemplified by Cicero. Mm -hmm. So Cicero was a politician, a, a public advocate, so he was a lawyer, and a philosopher. He was absolutely convinced with Socrates, he agreed with Socrates, that ethics are to rule not only politics in particular, but life in general. That is, you, you shouldn't really live a life that is not informed by your, by your ethics. He wrote an entire book called On Duty, where he tries to demonstrate that actually doing the right thing is also equi it's equivalent to doing what is best for you that what is best for you is always the, the the right thing it's always the ethical the ethical thing to do however 
because he was an actual politician and a lawyer, he was also very aware that the kind of rigidity that he saw in Cato was not helpful, that you it's it's good to have principles, but it's also good to remember that you need to deal with other people and and that means compromise, that the name of the game in politics is compromise. So let me let me quote you this thing because it, this is one of my favorite uh, in the book. At one point, Cicero is frustrated apparently with um, Cato and he writes a letter to his lifelong friend Atticus where he says, as for our friend Cato, you do not love him more than I do. But after all, with the very best intentions and the most absolute honesty, he sometimes does harm to the Republic. He speaks and votes as though he were in the Republic of Plato, not in the scum of Romulus. Right? I love this image that, you know, we don't live in Plato's Republic. We don't, we don't live in a utopia. We cannot yes. afford to always be inflexible. We live in the scum of Romulus. Romulus, of course, was the founder of Rome, right? And so we we live in a situation where you need to do what it what you can, and not always. That doesn't mean always what you would want to do. And that I think at the end of the at the day is really the the key. That, that is Cicero's attitude is really the key to a good good statesmanship a combination of you act on the basis of principles you don't you don't go machiavelli but at the same time you realize that you will probably need to compromise and that you might never reach the ultimate goal but you might try to get as close as possible as close as the the actual situation on the ground allows you now there's there's two ways to go from here, and I think um, in a moment it will be good to um, to talk about an issue that you brought up there with Cicero about the idea that doing your duty also turns out to be w what's good for you, and to to discuss that a bit because that takes us into um, into psychology to an extent. But yes. a, another thing, I was reading, um, I've I've been reading a book by uh, Gabor Mate and his son uh, Daniel Mate. Um, the myth of the normal, and um, actually, I've been listening to it on on Audible. And as I was going through it, there's, there was a chapter on leadership, and he said um, he I, I jotted it down because I thought it might be interesting to you. Um, and he says the traumatized or wounded elect the traumatized and wounded. So he's talking about the the way that in in a, in so much of the particularly our our rich Western nations that the myth of the normal is that it's it's normal to be a complete individualist. Um, it's normal right. to have these stressful lives. It's normal to look at look at this amount of inequality, and that where all of that's normalized, you have people who are traumatized and wounded. And um, he quoted some research by um, by someone someone Milburn, um, who whose research suggested that the more adverse childhood, it's something like violence, but it didn't need to be actual physical violence, um, was suffered by an individual, the greater their in inclination to support things like the death penalty or particularly authoritarian leaders, um, unless. They, the individual had psychotherapy. And so Gabo Mato was talking to the researcher and he said, what's the difference if they've had psychotherapy? And he said, an individual who has had psychotherapy is an individual who's willing to be wrong. And someone mm -hmm. whose character and it allows them to be wrong and to learn and to recognize that they have made mistakes rather than that mistakes were made and not by me is is someone who has who has the sort of you know one at least one of the elements of character that they can that they can that they can sort of overcome but but i just thought it was very interesting that um you know the the connection the strong connection really between between our our psychological health and our character and um and maybe political political choices and what kind of politics we might go for that's right i mean if you think about it socrates was the first one to put forth a no the notion that it that a good life what the, what the greeks called the eudaim eudaimonic life eudaimonia is is a good life right life of flourishing is the result of a uh, psychological balance in in your soul Right. It's it's or which, of course, you know, he, he was talking about soul. We talk about mind, but there's really not that much of a difference uh, for practical purposes. So the idea is that a psychologically well adjusted human being is a happy human being. Uh, and in fact, that that transcends even the external circumstances. That is, 
of course, external circumstances may be more or less desirable, right? If you, it's certainly better to be wealthy than to be poor. It's certainly better, as the Stoics would put it, uh, it's certainly better to be educated than not, and better to be health, healthy than sick, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as it turns out, in fact, both both the Stoics and modern research in um, in psychology shows that external circumstances affect us much less than we think. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there are plenty of examples when you know a lot of people, for instance, think that oh, if I only you know won the lottery, let's say, and made a bunch of money, I would be much happier. And it turns out that's just not true. Uh, what happens is people do win the lottery, and they their sort of subjective happiness goes up for a little bit. You know, uh, their the exhilaration of the new situation and all that and that lasts days or weeks, sometimes months, and then after that they go back to whatever level they had before. If they were unhappy, they're they're going to be millionaires but unhappy. And if they were happy, it doesn't matter that they have millions now. They're 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 pretty much where they were before. So happiness sometimes is, you know it's uh, one way to put it is it's an inside job, meaning mm-hmm. that it comes in comes from the inside. It doesn't uh, it doesn't really rely on external circumstances of course up to a point right i mean if if the external circumstances are really dire it's imagined for somebody to be to be happy but we're far more independent of external circumstances than we realize that said we live in a society that tries to convince us of the opposite right we're bombarded we live in a highly consumeristic society where we're bombarded by uh, images of, you know, if only you have the latest iPhone or if only you have the larger car or if only you have the bigger house and all, then you'll be happy. Then you'll be perfectly fine. And that's simply not true. It's, it's, it's uh, the kind of lie that of course makes, uh, you know, the pockets of people at Apple or Ford Motor Company, et cetera, et cetera, much and much larger, but no, it doesn't make us any happier. (laughs) No, it's interesting, though, I mean, that we are that this level of independence. But at the same time, there is this there is this sort of communal essence that I think that I think your 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 book stresses as well. Um, So although we might be external circumstances might have less impact on us, there is the suggestion that the that the health of a society that we're in and you know, the health um, psychologists are very aware of the health of the family structure in, in which we in which we rise through um, also makes an impact. And it's for that reason that I think these kind of pro-social um, aspects that come through in Stoic philosophy are so important, and particularly when we look at leaders. And I just thought it would be useful here if you would um, list some of those traits that um, that you that you sort of slaved through the through the book and through the work that you've done are the most important character traits before we sort of turn yeah. this more towards psychology. Yeah, first of all, I, I, I yes, I do agree that a social social connections, social cooperation, uh, relationships, those are crucial. That was realized, of course, by the by the Greco Romans, not just the Stoics, but for instance, the the Epicureans, for one thing, uh, and it certainly is. Uh, exactly what modern science tells us and again it goes back to those two characteristics that set aside the human species right rationality or at least the ability to be rational uh, and the high degree of sociality you know we we can survive on our own for sure under certain circumstances but we don't thrive unless we are in a social group unless we are you know in contact with with others um, there is there is a, another nice bit from cicero uh, who says you know even if you could ascend to the heavens and look at at planets and stars you would not that that experience as beautiful and as as transcending as it is it would not be meaningful unless you can share with somebody yeah. right so so yeah this notion that that it it is in large part about society. Uh, it's it, it's both the ancient idea as well as the the what comes out of modern science. In terms of the character traits, so depending on who you ask of the uh, the Greco Romans, you get a different list. Aristotle, who was very much into you know classification and taxonomy. Uh, he, he actually listed, I think, twelve different virtues or something like that. But the four, the fundamental ones, are four, and and they are referred to often as the cardinal virtues. And these are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Interestingly, these were the, these are actually first uh, listed by Plato in the Republic. That's the, er, the earliest that we find them. Of, of course, 
they were probably well known before, but it's the first time we get them in, in, in writing. Then they were adopted by the Stoics. And in fact, later on, much later on, they were also incorporated into the Christian uh, notion of virtue because Thomas Aquinas lists seven Christian virtues. And these seven are practical wisdom, courage, justice, temperance, hope, faith, and charity. So he just add, added the last three to the, the four classical ones. So what are these? These are You can think of the, the cardinal virtues as essentially providing us with a moral compass. That anything, the idea is that anything you do, you should ask yourself, well, is this wise? Is it courageous? Is it why is it just and is it temperate? And if the answer is yes to all of them, then do it. If the answer is not, then don't do it. It's essentially that's the way it works. Now, practical wisdom, it's a kind of a funny uh concept because we're many people might be familiar with the general notion of wisdom, you know. People allegedly get wiser when they get older. But oh, I definitely wisdom, have got so much wiser. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, but practical wisdom is kind of, a, you know, what do you mean by practical? The the, the word there in Greek is uh, phronesis, mm -hmm. and it was translated by Cicero in Latin as prudentia, so prudence. But prudence in modern English has has kind of changed its 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 meaning a little bit. To be prudent today just means to you know be careful, be be cautious about yeah. things. Well, on the other hand, in even if you go back by a century, a century and a half only in 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 English, prudence meant the ability to navigate complex situations in the best way possible. So that is what practical wisdom is, is the knowledge of what is really good for you and not good for you and how to steer your way through life in, in, in a way that is, in fact, the best. Courage, we often think of courage as, you know, oh, going to battle or, you know, physical courage. But that's really not what it is about. Courage is moral courage. It's the courage to do the right thing, even though it may cost you. Justice is the notion of treating other people with respect and dignity and fairness, pretty much the way in which you would want to be treated by them. Mm -hmm. And then finally, temperance is the idea that you should try to do things in right measure, neither too much nor, nor too little. So, so let me give you an example, for instance. Let's say that tomorrow I go back to work and I see my, uh, you know, I enter into the office and I see my boss uh, harassing a coworker which he would never do because he's a really nice guy. But nevertheless, let's imagine for a minute that he, that he, that he will. So what am I supposed to do? I, I, I'm witnessing this scene. Should I intervene? And how should I intervene? Or should I just mind my own business, you know, walk out? What, what should I do? So I ask myself the, the, the question in terms of the four cardinal virtues. In terms of practical wisdom, to intervene in a situation where you can help another human being is a good thing because it's actually good for your own character. Uh, and it's it improves yourself. It impro you're improving yourself if you if you are helpful to others. Why? Because cooperating and, and, and working with other people is actually a fundamental aspect of human nature. So you're actually becoming more excellent, right, by, uh, by doing that. So the first answer is, yeah, it seems to be like in terms of practical wisdom, I, I'm... I should intervene. Courage. Well, it will take courage to intervene because it's my boss, mm -hmm. right? So there could be repercussions. I could get fired. That's unlikely since I have tenure. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there could be repercussions. You know, there, there could be some kind of, of punishment or some kind of, you know, nasty behavior later on. So, but if it is the right thing to do, I really ought to have the courage to do it. Justice. Well, justice, as I said, is to treat other people fairly and in the way in which you would like to be treated. Well, I would certainly like it if I were the one to be being harassed, uh, that somebody else would step in and try to be helpful in the situation. So there, there's three yes already. What about temperance? Well, temperance tells me how to intervene. Right. Right. So because I could do too much. So I could jump into the tradition and start start punching my my boss on the nose. It's like, well, but that's um, that's not called for because it's not a violent situation. There's no there's no violent there's no physical danger here. Uh, so there is no reason to go that far. At the opposite extreme, I could do too little. I could just mumble something under my breath without anybody hearing me, and then say to myself, "Hey, I said something." So you know, and that's it. 
Clearly, I don't want to do any one of those two things. I want to steer a middle course. Temperance tells me, no, you need to step in clearly so that you're hurt, but also calmly so that you're going to diffuse the situation and not further you know, make things make things worse compared to what they are. So that's an, that's just one example. No, I think it's a, I think that. it's a great example. And the other thing that's that that comes to me when you're going through that example was with putting myself in that situation. You're going to feel an awful lot better about yourself if that's what you've done. And mm -hmm. um, and this is where this is where we can sort of look at the the psychological impact on it because when we had an email exchange before, I was suggesting to you that um, it seems that the um, the work that comes through the the philosophy of life, if you like, or the philosophy that helps to guide our guide our life, is it, it is in a way offering an expanded view of the idea of psychological health. So if if we uh, consider, you know, you can consider mental well being very very narrowly as you know the absence of, of 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 a mental illness or you can look at mental wellness more like a positive psychology mode as oh i'm i'm perfectly happy or you can expand it that bit further and say okay i i'm 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 coping well with life i feel pretty content but also i'm actually a i'm a good part of this whole structure that is society and it seems to me that um that this kind the kind of view that you that came through your book did seem to suggest that an idea of of that mental wholeness is something that does incorporate the way we treat others the way that we behave in the world not just something that's that's stuck in this um in in this sort of box mm -hmm. of bone that's exactly right in fact when i mentioned cicero's on duty yes. on duties that's that's where he, he articulates this view he says look sometimes people seem to think that what is good for them is not necessarily the virtuous thing. In fact, often they, they even suggest that doing the virtuous thing is at odds with doing the right thing. And and he tries to show that that is not the case. And the reason it's not the case is precisely what you just said. That is, we have a conscience. We have, you know, we have to live with, with what we do. So for instance, um, let's say I file my taxes and I cheat. And I, you know, I, I'm tempted to cheat because that's good. That's better for me, right? It's, it's. Uh, I had, I get more money for myself and less to the government, right? But it's also not right uh, because I am cheating not just the government. I'm cheating everybody else in in the country because they're paying their their share of, of taxes and I'm not. So it would that would seem to be like a situation where on the surface it's obvious that not doing the right thing is advantageous. But then I have to live with not doing the right thing, right? That, then I have to to live with my conscience. Would say, oh, I cheated. I, I'm I have an advantage here. I have more money in my bank, but that's because I cheated. And so now I start feeling bad about things. Mm. And that's why Cicero says that is a, it, that's the the obvious mark of the fact that the two things doing the right, what is right, and doing what is good for you are actually in synchrony not they're not a, a, opposed because it's a question of your psychological well-being now of course this doesn't apply to some of us you know if you're a psychopath you probably don't suffer from a, a heavy conscience but most people do and the reason most people do is not just because we uh, try to instill that kind of sentiment in people as they grow up right i mean i my my parents my grandparents tried to instill in me this notion that you need to do the right thing so there is certainly some cultural conditioning during our upbringing but the greco romans would say it's also in the nature of humanity it's instinctive to feel bad when you do something bad something that undermines the your connections with other people and modern primatologists agree because they find that uh the kind of behavior that we we think of as collaborative, pro-social, fair, et cetera, et cetera. It's not found just in human beings. It's found also in other social primates. Now, of course, they don't do it because they think about stuff. At least we think they don't think about stuff. We don't know for sure. You know, in, that ca in the case of other social primates, that behavior is instinctive. In the case of human beings, it's both. We have an instinct 
uh, as we grow up, as, as we're very little, little, we start immediately, you know, when we're infants, we start immediately well, making Like that research with babies as well, that, exactly. you know, that you, that they they will um, be more keen on the do doll that's been helpful in a, in a mind test. I'm Correct. sure m most of our listeners will be familiar with, the, with those Correct. examples. So developmental psychologists show that, yeah, that is in fact the case. We have a pro-social instinct. Now, the Greco-Romans, both Seneca and Cicero, for instance, tell us that nature provides us with the basics of virtue, with the beginnings of virtue, and then it's up to our reasoning ability to expand it. So what does that mean, for instance? Here is, a, here is an interesting, intriguing example that I've been uh, sort of thinking about for some time. We are instinctively pro-social, but we're also instinctively xenophobic. That is, uh, we have this notion that if it is somebody of our in-group that we're talking about, then yes, we should try to be helpful and collaborative and fair, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's somebody from the out-group, that's different. That that could be an enemy. That could be dangerous. Now, that, I would suggest that that is a result of a human evolution because you know for most of human evolution our in group was small it was like yeah. 60 to 80 people 100 people give or take mostly relatives you know uncles and, and aunts and things like that um and anybody that was coming from outside very likely was in fact dangerous it was not it was not good news but now we live in a in a society in a global society where we are all really on the same boat and and what happens in china or or in india does influence what happens here in the united mm -hmm. states or in europe directly it's not it's not we're not we're no longer disconnected we're no longer even if we don't meet those people what those people do affects us and vice versa and i think that that's a good example of what seneca and cicero meant when they said that nature gives us the beginnings of virtue but then it's up to our reasoning ability which is also given to us by nature to expand it right so yes i am naturally inclined to be nice and cooperative to people that i know to the people that i know and i have relationships with but then my reason comes in and says yeah but just because somebody's on the other side of the planet that doesn't mean that they're different they they're human beings they want the same right. stuff they fear the same things they are the same they, they go after the same the same things they have the same joys and sorrows etc cetera, etc cetera. therefore i ought to expand my circle of concern not just to the people that i know but to anybody uh, on the planet that means cosmopolitanism the the ancient notion of cosmopolitanism which was introduced by the cynic philosophers and then adopted by the stoic is exactly that one we are members of a cosmopolis a universal city of humanity and so we ought to really help anybody who is member of that of that city and i care even further and say we should help all earthlings but um but yes in fact <laughs> some modern stoics go that that far you know the ancient stoics were not particularly concerned with the environment and and other animal species because you know they were Two thousand years ago, they, they didn't know a lot of stuff that we we know today. But today we know that the biosphere is interconnected, and we also know that other animals suffer, uh, you know, just like human beings. Uh, in terms of animal, you know, treating animals, I think the even though I'm not a utilitarian, I think that the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham got it right. It, it, one point he was asked, you know, so how do we treat other other animals? And he said, well, the the question there is not whether they think or whether they talk. The question is whether they, they suffer. suffer. Yeah. yeah. If they it's suffer, very, that's very it. Powerful. Yeah, it is very powerful. Um in the through through the book, um, and you know, in line with the the Stoic tradition and and also is with Aristotelianism, um, your um your advice is that um is that character is that character is something that can be shaped and that the, the shaping works through habit through sort of working working on particular practices through trying to be what you what you aim towards being and i do think that's um that's very powerful it gives a lot of agency and i was thinking about um about that in line with um with psychotherapy when i was when i was doing a course i was doing a module on um on philosophy and um and psycho psychology philosophy and psychotherapy and one of the papers was um was a was a couple of writers who were suggesting how advantageous it would be to have psychotherapists 
um, working, helping people work towards not just mental health, but towards the character improvement, towards sort of self-development. Right. And interestingly, everyone else in the class thought this was sort of paternalistic and incredibly offensive and some kind of, you know, like dreadful big brother um, experience. And I was rather shocked because... Because you know, it seemed to me that um, it seemed to me that, that you know, I, I I suppose I do have this rather holistic view of of mental health as being something that's about being you know a, a, a good person on the outside, not like, not just on the inside. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was a psychotherapist who worked with addicts, and he said, "Well, of course, we I I had to I had to be doing that because I had to be able to teach people coping mechanisms. I had to help people to." become the best version of themselves because otherwise otherwise you know they they will struggle incredibly hard not to fall back into into the addiction so that had to be part of what i was doing yeah. and yeah and and it, and it does seem to me that we we have this we have this you know we want to separate things very firmly and that all i'm dealing with is your illness and once you're well the rest of your character can go to hell or whatever but yeah. But 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 to take this this sort of more complete view of a person seems as if it could offer an awful lot of benefits. Yeah, I I think you're right, and and I've encountered that attitude uh, before. In fact, one of the problems in talking about character and virtue is that at least in certain quarters, those are considered not only old fashioned kind of uh, concepts, but as you just said paternalistic right it's like oh you know who, who do you think you are that you can teach other people you know how to how to live their life essentially and then but but think about it for a second well you can accuse somebody of paternalism but you are ve- being incredibly arrogant and hubristic by essentially implying i don't need to be taught anything when it comes down to living my life because i know everything right it's like wait a minute hold on <laughs> um and also what do you think parents do Right. At least ideally, our parents teach us how to li- literally teach us how to live life. They mm-hmm. give us the basics of of morality, of ethics, and and also, you know, they instill values in us. They they guide us in terms of our choices and and so on and so forth. So it's like, what is that if not teaching other people how to live? Um, when you go to a priest or a rabbi or an imam or anything like that, and you're asking for advice, what are you doing if not asking uh, another person, you know, hey, how should I do? Uh, how should I behave in, under these circumstances? So I find it really peculiar that then people turn around and say, oh, no, no, we don't want to go to a philosopher or to a psychotherapist because, you know, that's paternalistic. It's like, wait, what? And, and Well, and it's also so crazy considering that there are so many influences it, it, to, to influence us. I mean, using the, you know, neurologists, ne- not um, neuroscientists to influence sort of advertising and the addiction of games or apps or whatever. There is so much that is influencing us away from the sort of exactly. temperance certainly and um and and so many other aspects of of like whether it's advertising or whether it's aspects of the internet or or what have you uh, that are working towards one way that it seems like you pretty much have to have the other way if you're going to even strike a balance of neutrality let alone moving towards good character exactly and now the, the in my mind This should be done particularly early on in life because modern science tells us that uh, by the time we reach our our early 20s, our brain development is pretty much done and our character is pretty much set. It can still be improved later because the human brain is plastic. We can can still learn things later, especially if we want to learn things later, but it becomes more difficult. It's kind of similar to playing a musical instrument, right? You or learn learning much a, or better. Learning a foreign or learning language. a language, exactly. Yeah. It, you, it can be done at any age, especially if you have the motivation. But it's certainly far easier when you're young because you know your your brain is so much more receptive and so much more uh, pliable. So why don't we teach virtue and character to our young kids? And and as I was sort of thinking about this the other day, uh, I went to see a movie called a documentary called Young Plato, which is set in Belfast. And it's about the principal of an elementary school trying to to introduce philosophy, practical philosophy, to the kids. And it's fascinating because, first of all, they react in an incredibly 
positive fashion because he's not giving them you know metaphysics or you know abstract things or things that can understand he's he's talking about bullying he's talking about violence he's talking about failure he's talking about all sorts of stuff that they can relate to the kids relate to and there's the, the movie is just fascinating because you see the interaction between uh you know the the, the teacher and uh the kids in terms of teaching not you know math or or literature or something like that but teaching values and and character and guess what the the principal does try to use a range of philosophers including some modern ones but most of the time he keeps coming back to mm. socrates and the stoics <laughs> there is an entire section in the in the documentary where uh it, which is about seneca and anger right because mm. of course the kids are angry uh, they're angry at each other they're sometimes angry at their parents uh and you know and they have to process that anger and so and they're helped by Seneca. So the, the very notion that somebody who lived 2,000 years ago and certainly didn't write for children, you know, 2,000 years later uh, is introduced in a classroom of, you know, seven or eight, nine years old. And these these kids are actually responding to it. Mm. Uh, it's To me, it's really amazing. But it raises the question of, you know, why don't we do that more more broadly, more more widely? And so typically there are two kinds, two people that resist uh, introducing ethics and other aspects of philosophy at a pre-college level. And these are politicians, local politicians especially, and parents, surprisingly. And I thought, why? wait, right, exactly. So why? And then and then there is a, a scene in the movie that made it very clear to me why. At some point, uh, the principal is talking to, uh, to his kids, and um, one of the kids said, you know, my parents keep telling me that the other side, you know, remember this is Belfast, right? Yeah. The other side is is, you know, evil and and mm -hmm. we need to be to need beat him up or you know, something like that. And um and the principal looks at him and says, Well, I'm gonna teach you how to argue with your parents. Oh no. <laughs> right. So so right. So that's why, of course, a lot of parents and politicians are not too happy about that sort of teaching because mm. that is questioning your you're teaching people yeah. and among other things to question authority. And authority, yeah. of course, usually doesn't like to be questioned. So so that's uh, that's what happens. But it's an incredibly positive example of how you can really do practical philosophy with kids we're talking elementary school kids that that does sound fascinating i'd, I'd like to watch that and do you, i know that you mentioned right at the beginning that your interest in in stoicism and in this sort of virtue ethics more widely but stoicism in particular arose through having a, a difficult time so clearly um or it, that suggests that you felt that um that this type of philosophy was helpful to you on a I mean, you know, I'm not suggesting you were sort of depressed or anxious, but that it was good for your mental equilibrium. Yeah, let's definitely. put it that way. Um, and so, do you do you feel there is a really strong crossover between this this sort of philosophy and and psychology in in the sort of broad terms that we've been talking about? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the things that that are happening in psychology recently is that a number of psychologists are moving away from the model of psychology fo being focused only on pathologies right so yeah there are pathologies there, there certainly are human pathologies of the of the body is just as much as of the mind but in the same way in which a healthy body is a question mostly of maintenance it's a question of prevention and you want to make you know a right to the intervention only at the at the last as the last resort, you ideally want your, you know, a, a good doctor would want his patients not to ever have to go to the doctor, right? Mm. You, you want them to exercise, you want to eat healthy and all that, taking care of their body, because that's the best way to live a healthy life. Similarly, I would think a good psychologist wouldn't want to have only people who are clinically depressed or, or, or anxious or anything like that. What you want is to teach people how not to get to that point, yeah. how to to live a psychologically healthy in a healthy fashion. And if you start doing that, then you're very close to philosophy at that point, right? Because yeah. then then you have to ask yourself, well, what is a psychologically 
healthy life for a human being? How do we actually teach uh, people that sort of thing? And now, now you can help yourself as a psychologist, not just to modern empirical evidence, which there is quite a bit about, you know, character and about, uh, you know, behavior in general, so healthy behavior in general, but you can help yourself to literally two and a half millennia of philosophical uh, thought. And that leads me to think um, that, you know, as as we might say, you know, a healthy mind in a healthy body, could we say healthy right. individuals in a healthy society and consider that, yeah. you know, the more healthy individuals there are in, in the in these sort of broad terms that we're talking about, then, you know, then you have a, a, a society with with substantially less toxic aspects. And um, this swings us back to the focus of the book with leaders that then right. you might be able to actually um, elect people who aren't traumatized and wounded because you might have that healthier society but do you but do you do you think that there is this uh, there is you know we've expanded the, the the idea of mental wellness beyond uh, not the absence of pathology but also to expand the idea of mental wellness from the individual to a much broader context yes and that of course is very challenging because now you're talking about if we're, if we're talking about structure society structure in society like let's say systemic racism for instance uh, or sec or sex, um, systemic sexism then now you're talking about something that of course an individual can do rather little about mm -hmm. um or even a philosopher or a psychologist can do very little about but nevertheless that doesn't mean it's not important to address and i do find that in in that area in the in the when it comes to structural issues some of the greco-roman philosophies tend to be deficient uh, because they're not focused on that at all like for instance stoicism for a Stoic, uh, the the kind of society in which we, you live, the kind of government that you have, you know, that so on and so forth, those are only preferred or dispreferred indifference, as they mm -hmm. say. In other words, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect your character. You know, yeah, you find yourself uh, under uh, tyranny or autocracy. Well, that's too bad. There's, you can't. There's not much you can do about it. Now you need to cope with it. Now you need to figure out how to cope with it. Now, that's important. Coping is important. And I think actually that some modern commentators, some modern authors, uh, de-emphasize emphasize too much the structural level and too little the personal level. They say, "Oh, we need to change society." Yes, we do. But what are we going to do in the meantime? Uh, you know, you you also need to teach people to cope with whatever situation they face because it is not in their power usually to change the situation to that extent. That mm. the two things are not mutually exclusive. In other yeah. words, we should really be working in both levels. And too often, I hear them presented as if they were yes you know, alternatives. You know, alternatives. Than, yeah. So, yeah. oh, you either do that. Or, no. Why? Why? Why would that be the case? Why? Why should I stop working on my own resilience uh, to a situation that I don't like, and at the same time work toward changing? The situation mm. itself right I, I that that's not now there are some ancient commentators and again i i go back to cicero here that we're aware of this uh cicero wrote on duties as i said earlier uh in terms of personal duties it's it's a it's one of those uh you know treatises that it's not very different from a stoic text so it's about you as an individual and how you function in whatever society you're given but then he also wrote De Republica, which was his response to Plato's Republic, where he talks about how we should structure a, a fair and just state. So you got both. Mm -hmm. And of course, you got both precisely because Cicero was that kind of unusual person who was both a politician and a philosopher, right? So he was very aware from a philosophical perspective, he was aware that you do need to work on your resilience and acceptance of things because there are some things you cannot change. But as a politician, he was also interested in changing things, right? in, in in making society a better place for everybody. And I think that those two things really are not, not only they're not mutually exclusive, they're actually self-reinforcing. They're mutually reinforcing. So how are we going to get these these leaders that aren't like Alcibiades, the leaders who I, I mean, and where are the Socrateses that are going to be that are going to be guiding them? I, I guess I guess we we kind of have to hope that these people come out of the future readership of your book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would. But well, ultimately, in the book, I unfortunately, I guess, in some respect, uh, come to the conclusion that it's our own damn fault, because at least in 
in democratic or more or less democratic societies, uh, after all, we are the people who put those people, those those leaders in charge, right? I mean, it's it's always fun to complain about uh, the politics. You know, politicians in the United States um, are are seen by the public as the almost the lowest level of society in terms of trustworthiness. They're, they're right? not doing much better here, actually. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like you know, poll after poll shows that you know politicians are all the way down. You know, the, the, they're barely above the level of uh, murderers and 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 rapists. And yet, you would say, well, but who elects those people? We do, right? I mean, if we're talking about an autocratic country, let's say Russia, that's a different issue. Uh, people don't have a lot of a choice there. But we do, more or less, because, of course, I, I tend to think, for instance, as of the United States, more as an oligarchy at this point than as a democracy. But nevertheless, there are democratic, there is sufficient democratic input then at the end of the day, we are the ones that are responsible. And so we are now coming full circle. That's why the quest for character is important. It's not just important for politicians. It's important for us. If we don't improve our own character, if we don't start paying attention to people of good character and start pushing those people, like Socrates did in Athens, to run for, for uh, as statesmen and and conversely, if we don't start pushing people that shouldn't be politicians away, mm. then we get what we deserve. It's, you know, it's ultimately so, it comes down to that. <laughs> so we, so if we should sort of go back to what I was saying, Gabor Mate's uh, idea that the traumatized are electing the traumatized and the wounded are electing the wounded. If we can um, work through our own areas of wounds and our own areas of trauma and our own areas of poor character, then yeah. we're in a better position to 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 elect those who are not traumatized, those who are not wounded, and those who have the kind of character that we want. Correct. And I think one important way of doing that is to get psychologists and philosophers in the sense of practical philosophers to work with people, because that's how you convince people that they need to take care of their mental health and mental health includes character, includes working on your your views of the world, your priorities, your your behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful. I think that's that's an inspiring rally call. Um, is there are there any other aspects um, from the book or or more generally that that we haven't addressed that you'd really like people to know, Massimo? Well, the last chapter in the book, which is mostly about the modern evidence, so the, most of the book is about the ancient Greco-Roman examples because they're fascinating and they're and they're you know historically interesting. But in in the end, the book does come to modern times and to modern science because you know we live in the twenty first century. And so, what I would like to uh, remind people is that there is very clear evidence of what works and what doesn't work in order to improve our character. And so don't do the things that don't work and try to do the things that do work. For instance, you know, just let me give you one example of mm. each. One thing that doesn't work, for instance, um, is virtue labeling. You know, we're told, to, we're told to tell our kids that they're brilliant, that they'll succeed, even though they're clearly not brilliant and they probably won't succeed. And there's pretty good evidence that that's just not going to improve things. Uh, you may boost self-confidence, but if that self-confidence is actually not based on a substance, it's not based on something that comes from the inside, in, in the long run, it's not going to do any, any good. In fact, it's it is damaging. Yeah, it's fragile. It, it becomes, you know, it's damaging. So that's one thing that doesn't work. So don't do it. One thing that does work is to uh, engage in uh, sustained self-analysis. So the classic example yeah. is philosophical journals like the like Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, for instance. Right. Uh, the notion there is spend some time, ideally every day, but at least several times a week, just a few minutes before you go to bed, sit down for your computer or open a, you know, God forbid, open an actual diary made of, you know, paper and 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 pick up a pen and write down your thoughts about something that has happened during the day that has valence in terms of ethics and character. And ask yourself three questions. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? And what could I do better next time? The first question, what, what, did, I, what I did wrong, 
It's not because you want to punish yourself for indulgent regret or anything. Those are completely useless things. It's because you want to learn from your experiences. Right? So, oh, today I reacted, you know, I got angry with a colleague, for instance. Well, that was not a good reaction. So let me put it into, let me pay attention to that. The second question, what did I, what did I do right, is because you want to keep track of those things that what you get right as well because ultimately what you want is to move away as much as possible from the not 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 good stuff not good behavior and as much as possible toward the good behavior so you want the, those points of reference the third question is arguably the most important one that is what could i do better next time mm. situations will recur you, we go to work every day we see the same people we encounter very similar situations. Then at home, we come back home every night and we see the same people. We encounter similar situations. We go yeah. on vacations or we go and have a weekend. We see the same people and we encounter similar situations. So if you make a mistake once, you get upset or angry or you yell at somebody. And then you reflect on it and say, okay, next time that I see something like this developing, here's what I'm going to do. You are preparing your mind for a better response. And a mind prepared is is a goes a long way toward actually responding better the next time. And the more you do respond better, the more that becomes a habit and the, and therefore your character has improved. And actually, I, I really I've got the book that we published a couple of years ago, which has got that, those kind of exercises in it. And and I <laughs> I did them. And um, and I have to say, <laughs> I have to say it has actually worked because um, I might. Oh, I hope my father isn't listening. My dad um, phones me every, every night. I had a bad accident about 10 years ago and he used to phone me every night because when I came out of the hospital, I was very weak. And so he was phoning me every night and we hadn't had that kind of contact for a long time. But, you know, he was checking I hadn't died. And as time moved on and I was getting better, I said to him, oh, are you just going to stop phoning me now? Oh, there it is. It's over there. A bit like mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and I said, are you going to stop phoning me? And he said, no, 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 I'll carry on phoning you. So he has been phoning me at 6.45 every evening for the last 10 years, uh, unless right. I've been working abroad or, you know, but basically sure. pretty much every night. So, of course, you know, we have nothing to say to each other. And, you know, your dad can be really annoying. And your dad has these stupid jokes that he insists on saying to you every <laughs> single time i used to go to yoga on tuesday nights and oh are you off to yogurt and i used to want to throttle you know but i i find i can i don't for a while i was just doing the kind of like yeah okay and after a while that habit became do you know and i the the sort of like smiling and the gentleness and i remembered how much i love him and how much i'm grateful for him however however you know annoying those prompts would have been to me so there okay. you have it it works <laughs> it works yeah, yeah. there's pretty good evidence it works and and you're yet another piece of evidence that, that it does work <laughs> thank you so much is there anywhere um online that people should um look out for you and and follow up and just remind people of the of the of the title of this book and and any other information that you'd like people to be yes able to keep so out? people can find me online at massimopilucci.org uh so you, you find everything there all my essays and podcasts and videos and all that sort of stuff and as far as the book is concerned is the quest for character in the uk and parts of europe is going to be published is published already as how to be good wonderful well be good and and if you can't be clever is that right <laughs> <laughs> take care yeah, that's thank, it, yeah. <laughs> take care and thank you so much um for, you. for another fascinating interview on shrink radio it was a pleasure thanks for having me